the first speaker is uh, Hans Thies Lehmann, and uh, I wouldn't ca call you a guru, but the, your book, first German edition from 1999, then translated to English in 2006, has been of really great importance, profound importance. Uh, I have used it myself when I wrote a kind of thesis on a choreographer, a Swedish choreographer, Mats Ek, and I found that many of the references in your book are references to dance, actually. Pina Bausch, William Forsythe, many of the great choreographers are very present, so it's also reflecting the fact that we don't separate that strictly any longer between dramatic theater, dance, and other stage uh, forms, other stage arts, which put us back how it was uh, in, until the 19th century, when everything took place in the same theater building. And then came Ibsen and destroyed it all and said, no music in my place, please. And then there was this separation. This is how it was made in Sweden, at least. There were different houses, one for opera and ballet, one for dramatic theater. So uh, I think you helped us a lot to sort out what is theater, uh, what is performing arts in the 1980s, 90s, and, and personally, I used it a lot and I quoted you many times. Thank you for that. I'm very pleased that you are here in, in person and, and everything and can talk to us about Brecht, which is not, the first thing you think about Brecht is not laughing, is it? Please explain to us how you feel about this. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and laudable introduction and uh, dear Octavia and dear friends from the International Association of Theatre Critics and all the supporters of this event. I want to express first my special gratitude for the invitation to speak here today because this is indeed a very special day for the German theatre life. Yesterday took place the goodbye party at the Volksbühne am Rosa Luxemburg Platz in Berlin. Arguably this Volksbühne is the most interesting and innovative theatre in Germany today. And there is a little cultural war going on now because the successor for the director Frank Kastorf is supposed to be Chris Derkon, the curator, who demonstrated meanwhile that he knows well the market mechanism in the field of visual arts, but is not familiar with either the specific of theater, nor with the mentality of people working there, nor with the specific aesthetic aspects of the art of theater. And uh, this is uh, a sad moment in one way, the tragedy of the comedy of uh, Volksbühne is happening now. But I want to take this opportunity to take a look at this present situation and on the past 25 years of Volksbühne under the direction of Frank Kastorf. That this theater was in general to be called post-dramatic is meanwhile nothing special any longer. If you take theater treffen, you have to look out very much to find a dramatic theater piece because everything happens now in the theater which is not dramatic. Castor's way of working was from the beginning more or less explicitly directed against the purely aesthetic kind of directing of Peter Stein, the famous director of the Schaubühne, against his all too consumable naturalism. Everywhere now, the artists show a tendency to have a certain distrust in the aesthetic value of art as such. They are undermining the purely aesthetic pleasure of their work by overdetermining the artistic aspect by others. They document, they bring in political discourse, philosophical thinking, teaching, encounters, and all, all kinds of activities. A certain raw approach of form constituted a contradiction to the elegance of the Stein productions. An anarchic and even nihilistic atmosphere was to be found in the Volksbühne Theater. It brought to a theater a new kind of vitality. The actors were mostly loud. Often you may have gained the impression of a kind of hysterical overacting if, if you were not used to it. A lot of aggression towards the spectators happened. 
It was like a constant interaction going on between audience and stage. This new style has been, has been described and analyzed a couple of times. But one of its features has, as far as I can see, not gained enough critical attention. And that's around the theme you have chosen here. Let me put it in a simple phrase. Spectators were allowed to laugh again. Believe me that this is a circumstance worth mentioning in German theater. German theater doesn't dispose of a great reservoir of comedy. Its mainstream theater was always serious. But in the last 20 years or so, the small stream of comic theater broadened in a spectacular way. It was largely the Volksbühne who carried this new movement. So we have now two tendencies we can observe in the German theater today, in the last 20 years or 25 years. A certain anti-aesthetic aesthetics and the remote appearance of comic and comedy. I will try to elaborate on the inner connection of these two aspects and then try to place Brecht and his continuing influence in this, in this context. Now, so in relation to the title, I go to the, the sequence reverse. I speak first about the theater, then about comedy, then about Brecht. Frank Kastorf could associate, could Rines associates Christoph Martaler and Christoph Lingensief. René Polesch is a dominant force as an author there, and since roughly five years, the excellent actor Herbert Fritsch has made as a director of importance. It is important not to forget the impact, impact of stage designers like Anna Fiebrock and Bert Neumann, and a number of brilliant actors like Sophie Reuss, Henry Hübchen, Martin Wuttke, Fabian Hinrichs as well, as the impact of radically non-conformist, highly creative dramaturgs, like in the beginnings Matthias Lilienthal, then Karl Hegemann and Stephanie Karp. So, since Kastorf became the director of the Volksbühne 20, 25 years ago, the theater developed a unique kind of audience contact. First of all, as I said, in the performances themselves. But this was not the only aspect. The theater, the theater fulfilled also a, a criterion which I personally find very important in theater life today. It was interesting even if you were not just watching a performance. All the time something was going on in the foyers, in the bars, in the red and green saloon, sometimes also on the big stage. Debates, lectures, informal talks, little music performances and so on. The audience soon understood that they had to be prepared for sudden changes of perspective. Comparable in this respect to the cutting technique of Jean-Luc Godard. You often are at a loss of understanding why A is followed by B. More often than not, you find the answer only later when C and D explain ex post the presence of B. So, the theater was not in the service of one text, but the text was used by the theater people because they were interested in the text. It developed into a place where the disappointment and the anger, especially of the ex-GDR people, found expression. They lost illusions of socialist ideals and the shock about the all-too-speedy victory of the discourse of money in the East. So, in an unexpected transformation, the German state looks, the German stage looks very different from its past. Certainly, the political and the social responsibility did not simply go away. But there's now definitely permission to laugh. He who enters the, the theater, the expectation of continual story or easily, easily readable meaning is to quickly change his mind or else he would not find much to enjoy. At the same time, about as Kastorf began his career in the West, there was also Christoph Martaler with his peculiar humor popping up in the scene, 1993. Moxin Europea, Moxin, Moxin, Moxin up. And he stayed connected to the Volksbühne. Now, this comic spirit is interestingly enough produced by Kastorf, who was a director, by Martaler, who came, was originally a musician, by 
René Polish, who was in turn an author, and now Herbert Fritsch, who is an actor. And started to stage text and some developed hilariously a comic style of theater, which is now widely acclaimed. There are also another numbers, a number of other theaters. And you can also find now a mixture of serious political subject matter, this irony, comic, the absurd, Dada and grotesque humor. You also find this mixture in the work of Christoph Lingensief. You may have heard about one of the other of his performances. But what was there, the point was, was often this, that you were never precisely certain if something was really serious or something was simply sheer nonsense. Likewise, a group like Ant Company and Co. mixes systematically data in politics. And the serious political issues raised by Rimini Protocol or Shishi Pop have tendency to end up, love, end up less in serious lessons about, but mainly in the demonstration of the ridiculous absurdity of our capitalist way of life. The critic of reality is presented in a playful way. So that the laughter of humor has a chance. I don't, of course, claim that there was no comic theater before, but the new development is that comedy is now accepted by critics and audiences alike. For example, if Herbert Fritsch in Der Demand stages pieces of concrete poetry, it's clear that such text doesn't offer any meaning, but produces its pleasure just by exposing the concrete material of sounds and vocals of the language, playing with it in a rhythmical way so to say, x-raying the body of the language. Now it's interesting to ask, if not art theatre with a big A is in crisis generally, it is obvious that the aspect that the respect of art is dwindling away and new forms of communication appear, games and plays, events, encounters, debates. All of them value higher the process the element of place and the perfection of form. Jean-Luc Nancy has asked this question, what remains of art? Perhaps no more, he says, than a remnant. Nancy continues with the consideration, I quote him, if not art as such shows its essence best, but is only a remnant of itself, that it does not produce any big works any longer, but seems to be over and only shows that it is past. The quality of being remnant makes it possible that art only appears as a margin of other discourses. Now, obviously, this formula of Nancy stands in the tradition of one famous concept of philosophical, of philosophical tradition, in Hegel's aesthetics about the end of art. It is known that Hegel assigns to art a very high position in the life of the spirit. Nevertheless, he stated, I quote Hegel, that nevertheless art is neither in its content nor in its form the highest and absolute way for the spirit to become conscious of its true interest. So the most beautiful is not the highest. I might just uh, remind you of this, this triad that you find in, in Hegel. Art, religion, philosophy is a process of history in Hegel's view which is a process obviously of abstraction. Less and less material and image, more and more abstraction and concept. And he says, the peculiar kind of the production of artworks is not adequate anymore to our highest need. Thinking and reflection have outwitted a beautiful art. Who likes to enjoy wailing and complaining might may take this reality for, uh, for terrible. But pieces have made it as a fact that art can no longer give us the same satisfaction for spiritual needs. He conceived the ending of art in the comedy and as comedy. The reason for this is simple. The comedy takes place exactly in the moment of complete liberation of the spirit from all higher or deeper laws or religious or otherwise forces. For the comic artist, nothing remains absolutely holy. So Antigone could never be in a comedy. 
In this way, the comedy is a bridge between the world of values, which are essential for the human being, if they, even if they lead into tragic conflicts among opposing values on the one hand, and the world which is completely free of any irrational ideas and motives or behaviors. As everything in Hegel appears twice, so also, of course, the comedy, systematically and historically. So historically, he places the Attic comedy at the end of the face of the religion of art of the Greeks. The next step is then the Roman Empire, which develops the modern concept of rationality, state, and individual persona with a legal status. And systematically, in the end of the third form of art, that is the art of modernity, which Hegel calls romantic art form, dissolves in the present time, also in the spirit of comedy. The modern self-consciousness, says Hegel, is fundamentally ironic. There's no longer any absolute value to follow, but the subject can really experience existence as an endless series of free choices, which has a problem of being equally meaningless. At this point, there should be no error about it. Nothing less but the constitution of theater as, as aesthetic device in general is at stake. At stake is fictional cosmos, the aesthetic difference, the separation between audience and the stage. There's a tradition in philosophy which puts philosophy itself in close relation to tragedy. Tragedy always displays the tendency to destroy or at least to disturb precisely the vital nerve of philosophy that is clear-cut distinctions and categories by ambivalence and ambiguity. I have elsewhere discussed this peculiar relation of rivalry between tragedy and philosophy, and I don't want to come back to this today. The relation between comedy and philosophy is somewhat different. Since Hegel, at least comedy and the comic is thought to be the paradigmatic experience of modernity. And here we hit on the inner connection between the two aspects of theater life, which I identified. The first, art in the face of the end of art, and second, the new spirit of comedy. They are closely bound together by the fact that for Hegel, comedy is connected most intim intimately to the concept of the end of art. Comedy is, to be more precise, the last phase of art before it dissolves into abstract thinking. The modern mind is analyzed by Hegel in a way which comes close to a series of, to a kind of postmodernism avant la lettre. The artist today has as a material of the world everything is at his disposal, but in such a way that this world presents only ironic ironic fragments to him. This paradoxical situation places the artist continuously before the problem how to create art after the phase of, of art, how to create art which can only be art in its ending. So before I come to Brecht, I will say one word about myself because up to now I've never written about comedy. I've always written about tragedy. For mainly also from egotistic reasons. Because if somebody like myself really likes to laugh in theater, a good comedy is very rare. It's a very rare bird. And as a tragedy, if a tragedy is badly played or put on stage, there remains still something of the text of meaning substance in which I can hold fast when I'm disappointed. But if the comedy doesn't work, it remains nothing. Now you may ask, what has all this to do with Brecht? And I start by referring to an insight which Walter Benjamin risked to essay already in the 1930s. He said then, it is probable that already soon people will recognize that the level of Brecht's work, which is the traditionally called the artistic, is the most incidental, the bilofigste, the least importance. It is probable that already soon people will recognize that the level of Brecht's work, which is traditionally called the artistic one, is the most incidental of it. 
So Brecht is a towering example, we might say, of the artist who is producing a historical moment and art is no longer of the essence. In this specific position of Brecht, we find the reason for his continuing influence. He is already the artist in whom the artist of today finds a mirror image of the paradoxical situation to create art in the time in the, of the end of art. And uh, this is, of course, especially true if you think of the learning place. But before I come to the learning place, I want to discuss a little more of what, what the epic theater in general of Brecht was doing. For Brecht, epic theater was another name for theory of political analysis. Now, what does it mean? There's an abyss in between. On the one hand, any idea of realism in the sense of doubling the reality as a picture, and on the other hand, the way Walter Benjamin described it in what is epic theater. This is an allegory of Benjamin of what the epic theater of Brecht tries to achieve. And she, shares, she writes, the most primitive example of epic theater, a family scene. Suddenly a stranger enters. The woman has just about, is just about to grab a vase in order to throw it after the daughter. The father was just going to open the window to call for a policeman. In this moment, the stranger appears in the door. Tableau, as people used to say around 1900. This means the stranger is confronted with a state of things. Deranged traces, open window, destroyed furniture. But there's a point of view from which even more usual scenes of bourgeois life don't look very different from this. Now, the ambiguity and chaos of the scene doesn't allow any doubt that was indeed intended here has nothing to do with realism, whatever you may extend the notion. Rather, it's about the sudden shock like suspension of rational analysis and understanding. It is comic and above all, it is surreal. It has more to do with the surrealism than with realism. And it is interesting that beside Benjamin also Theodor V. Adorno, already in 1930 when came out Mahagoni, he wrote Mahagoni is the first surrealist opera. Benjamin's analysis makes it clear that Verbrecht theater is about the incomprehensibility of everyday life. On many occasions, Brecht has stated this explicitly. So what I want to stress is that Benjamin's analysis makes it clear that for theater Brecht, for, for Brecht theater is about the incomprehensibility of everyday life. On many occasions, Brecht has stated this explicitly. He says once, for example, the relations between human beings in our world are absolutely incomprehensible. It is the task of theater to expose this incomprehensibility in a sublime and big way. This is, of course, the direct opposite to the simplistic notion, which is so far spread, that the family scene should explain or teach the audience the deeper social logic which is in it at work. But this idea is exactly what no longer but no longer, not long ago, a dramaturg demanded in Germany in the name of Brecht. He writes, the scene of bourgeois family life becomes realistic in the sense of Brecht only if behind the appearances which are recognizable, the deep logic becomes visible, which produces a kind of behavior between the members of the family which we can see. I can only add a lot of pleasure, which is Asker Klukacz. My own first experience with Brecht Theater was the Berlin Ensemble staging of Arturo Ui with Eckhard Schall in the leading role. I remember distinctly what I loved most about this unique performance of the late 50s. It was a pure amusement and yet bringing the audience back to terror and self-criticism. From today's perspective, the elements of circus and show are recognizable as an early example of the inclusion of pop culture in the theater. Theater must be able to keep circus like variety aspects even when treating a most serious subject. After 1945, Brecht probably was in an uncertain satirical mode 
might be in danger of rendering fascism too harmless atmosphere. He thought of creating this, by the way, very Brechtian ending. And then he wrote this final phrases where it says, Yaba learn Tribansi Chatziert, and so forth. It is more important today in theatre that the spectator has to decide for himself what to take serious and what not than to make this clear to him because this is activating his own way of thinking. And I believe, I'm deeply convinced that no political effect even social influence is possible for theater as long as it does not change the usual forms of perception. So the young Lukács could write, the young Lukács still could write, the truly social dimension of art is in the form, not in the context. And today I think that demontage and deconstruction of political simulacra and theater must mean, uh, above all, the avoidance of the moralistic trap. Because in the view of ambiguity and the, ickle, and the terrible corruption of, our, of public discourse, there's, it's understandable that many people, especially young, young people, find a new way of looking at the world by new moral by new moralism. But nothing could be more questionable than the recourse to a natural feeling for moral. It, it, it blocks any attempt for better understanding of the political. It is worse even. It, it makes it appeal. It's, uh, Appelliert. It's uh, it calls upon a spontaneous general reaction, and which we have had as gesundes Volksempfinden once already. So the moralism appeals for by of by serving seemingly certainties of distinction between good and bad and blocks the precise, precise, precise reality of the problems. And so, from the point of theater, it's the, the essential point, which is by comedy, is the uh, is the comic dimension that the spectator does not become the judge. And I feel that this is a problem which Brecht had brought to us and that is neglected, misunderstood today largely. Okay, I'll stop here. Okay. Hmm. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat>